This is episode number three with Dr. John Demartini. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Dr. John Demartini is considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal development. He is the founder of the Demartini Institute, a private research and education organization with a curriculum of over 72 different courses covering multiple aspects of human development. His trademark methodologies, the Demartini Method and the Demartini Value Determination, are the curriculum of 42 years of cross disciplinary research and study. His work has been incorporated into human development industries across the world. Now, he has authored 40 books in over 29 different languages. He has produced over 60 CDs and DVDs covering subjects such as development in relationships, wealth, education, and business. Each program is designed to assist people to activate leadership and empower themselves in all the areas of their life. Now, I met John about five years ago when I first interviewed him in his hotel room here in Sydney and we've since become friends and he's one of my husband's good friends as well. So he's a brilliant man and a wealth of knowledge and I'm so excited for you guys to soak up all of his wisdom and knowledge in this uh, interview today. So in this interview we chat about one of the key things that will solve all of your relationship issues. This is such a goodie. We also talk about how he was dyslexic as a child and what being homeless and living on the streets at age 13 was like for him and what it taught him. We also discussed the importance of understanding and knowing your core values and those of the people around you and how it can stop all of your suffering. We also chat about how to grow and move through adversity, how your judgments are causing all of your suffering, the real purpose of all of your relationships, and trust me, this is not what you think, plus so much more. Everything that we mention will be in the show notes and you can check that out at melissaambrosini.com forward slash three. I am so excited for you guys to hear this interview with the one and only Dr. John Demartini. Welcome, John. I am so grateful to have you here. Before we dive in, could you just share with us what you had for breakfast this morning? Uh, I had some cantaloupe and some watermelon and some beautiful um, plain yogurt and some multigrain toast. Sounds good. Now, I have attended your weekend seminar, The Breakthrough Experience. I've read a lot of your books, which both the seminar and the books have been absolutely life-changing for myself and my husband, whom you know. Uh, And one of the best concepts that's really radically helped not only my relationship with my husband, but also my relationships in general, is the idea of seeing that other side. Can you explain to us what that means and how to do it and why it's key to solving all of your relationship issues? Well, if, if I was to approach somebody and say to them, uh, you're always nice, you're never mean, you're always kind, you're never cruel, you're always positive, you're never negative, you're always peaceful, you're never warful, you're always giving, you're never taking, you're always generous, you're never stingy, uh, they wouldn't believe it. There would be an internal thermostat that would say, mm, bullshit meters up. And if I said, you're always mean, you're never nice, you're always cruel, you're never kind, you're always negative, you're never positive, you're always warful, never peaceful, you're always taking, you're never giving, they would also say, "Mm, bullshit your meters up. But if I said to them, sometimes they're kind, sometimes they're cruel, sometimes they're nice, sometimes they're mean, sometimes they're pleasant and unpleasant and peaceful and warful and generous and stingy, they would go, that's me. So we have an innate thermostat knowing that we have a pair of opposites, both sides to our behavior. When things support our highest values, we tend to open up and become pleasant. When things challenge our highest values, we can close down and play the opposite role. So it's unrealistic to expect a human being to be one-sided. And so when you're in a relationship, anytime you project an assumption 
or an expectation that any human being is supposed to be one-sided, you set yourself up for having what I call the ABCDEFGs of negativity, which is anger and aggression, blame and feelings of betrayal, criticism and challenge, despair and depression, desire to exit and escape, frustration and grouchiness. So as long as we have these unrealistic expectations, we're going to have those reactions to give us a feedback to let us know that we're not real in our expectations. And we need to expect people to have both sides. That's how we learn to appreciate. I always say love is a balance of both sides. Sometimes we confuse infatuation with love, but love is embracing both sides of life. Mm, Yes, I couldn't agree more. So let's talk about projections in a relationship. Like what are projections for someone who's never heard of these projections and expectations and for someone who's like, well, he's my husband, he should do X, Y, and Z, or that's my mother, she should do X, Y, and Z. How do we approach that? And uh, how is this detrimental to our relationships? Well, each individual uh, has a unique fingerprint snowflake specific set of values and priorities, things that are most important to least important in their life. And through that set of values, they filter their reality through their senses and they project onto their reality through their actions and expectations. So in other words, if my highest value is say education, I'll have a tendency to see my children, for instance, is when they're doing things that are highly educational, I'll be proud of them, right? But if they're not doing their education, I'll feel, hmm, it's not good. So I will tend to project my values onto them. Now, they may have a totally different set of values. In fact, my, uh, one of my daughters is very much into fashion. She's really not interested in academia. She was interested in fashion. She's running a major fashion show and company today. But at the time, if she wasn't in school, I would, I would react and I would project. And if she was in school, then I was, you know, I was soft and easy on her. So we have a tendency to filter our reality and project onto our reality what we think is valuable. Now, what they have as valuable is different. And if we don't care enough about the other person to find out what they value, and we keep projecting our values on them, they're going to feel unloved by us, and they're going to feel that they have to live up to expectations, which is going to make them want to withdraw from us. So we alienate the people that we actually care about because we don't honor them by communicating our values in terms of their values. And we, and if we, as long as we project assumptions onto them that they're supposed to live in our values instead of their own, we set ourselves up for those A, B, C, D, E, F, Gs of negativity. They can only make decisions based on their own values. And the only thing you can ever expect somebody to do is make decisions according to what they value most. It's so easy to say. And when we're in the midst of a heated argument, how do we remind ourselves of this? Is it is it a, a matter of saying, oh, okay, remembering and being aware that they're just acting in accordance to their values? Is it as simple as that? Well, what I do, I found there's, there's two things that I, I recommend that really nip it in the bud. And that is simply uh, sitting down and going through a value determination exercise, which, as you know, I have on my website. It's free. It takes 30 minutes, and it helps a person discern what is really valuable to the person. And it's worth doing. So whoever's listening, I can encourage you to take the time to do it. Yeah, we can put it in the, in the show notes so that everyone can go and check it out. I really highly encourage it because it's, it makes a big difference. But what it does is it goes through and makes a look or takes a look at exactly what you really value. Because if you just ask somebody, what do you value? 99% of the population will give you social idealisms that have been injected in by society about what they think it should be instead of what it actually is. So first, identifying what is really valuable is key. And uh, I look at that by how I how people fill their space, how they spend their time, what energizes them, what they spend their money on what they are most organized in, where they're most disciplined, what they think about, visualize, and affirm most about their life that's coming true, what do they love conversing about, what inspires them, what are the top three goals that are coming true that they have, and what is it that they love learning about. Once I get those narrowed down, that really pins it down to what's really important, not the ideals. Then I do is I identify the top three values. Because their life revolves around their highest value. That's their identity. That's what they want to be loved for. So finding out what that is is crucial. Then asking a simple question. You do the same thing for yourself. You need to know what your highest values are. Then you ask a simple question. 
how specifically are the top three values of my partner, particularly the top one, how specifically is helping me fulfill my top three values, my particular top one? And I answer that 25 to 30 times minimum. I like to do it up to 50 to 80 times and just keep asking that. Because if I can't see how what they're dedicated to is serving my highest values, what I'm dedicated to, I'm going to want to change them. I'm going to talk down to them. They're going to challenge me and I'm going to be wanting to fix them and I'm going to project. But if I can see how what they're doing is serving me, there's nothing to fix. And they want to be loved for who they are. And that's the fastest way to do it. Then you turn around and ask how specifically is my top three values, particularly my top one, the thing I'm most dedicated to, helping them fulfill theirs. And I answer that 30, 50, 80 times. And that way I have plenty of information to communicate in their value with. I can see how I'm helping them. So when I'm caring about them, I can consider them and their values when I'm talking to them. And I can more easily communicate and have a dialogue instead of two alternating monologues. That's where most people are. Then I go through and I do the, what I call the Demartini method, the thing that I teach in the breakthrough experience, which is asking very poignant questions of whatever I see in them, where do I demonstrate it? Which humbles me and allows me to realize that whatever I see in them is a reflection of me. And then I ask, how specifically does it serve me? Because if I can't see how whatever people are doing is serving me, I'm automatically going to want to change them and fix them and want to get retaliative. And then I find out where do they have the opposite. So I break any labels I start to accumulate on them. And then I ask when they're doing what they're doing, who's doing the opposite? Because if I'm addicted to somebody supporting me and they challenge me, it's because of my addiction to the other that they're having to come in and bring me back into balance. So I go through a series of questions that help me humble my own reactions. And if I do that in advance, I preempt many of the arguments that we face. This is basically what you just described is your breakthrough experience, the Martini method, which I got to experience on your weekend workshop, which I absolutely love. And I just wanted to share a little bit about my experience. So on that Saturday, when I walked into your weekend workshop, which for those who have never done the breakthrough experience, it's it's all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and you're there, you know, from eight o'clock in the morning till midnight on the Saturday, and then eight o'clock again on the Sunday morning till quite late again. The reason why I went to be honest, was I had a particular relationship that I was really struggling with. And I had so much anger and frustration and resentment, all of those sorts of feelings toward this particular person. And if you had have said to me that you're going to walk out on the Sunday night feeling nothing but love and gratitude for that person, I would have spat out my green juice. But that's exactly what happened. I can't even believe now it, it is mind-blowing how powerful your method, the Martini method is because on that Saturday morning, I walked in with anger and frustration and resentment. And on the Sunday, I walked out with nothing but love and gratitude. Can you tell people how the hell you do that? I mean, you just explained basically what the method is about. Is there anything else that you can share about how people could kind of, if they haven't been to one of your seminars, how they could kind of implement it into their life today? Yeah, I am. Many years ago, I noticed that uh, many times when I was talking to people and getting heated even, that whatever I was saying to them also was needed for me. I was talking to myself. Chomsky, Norm Chomsky, in his work on language showed that our communication with others is only half. Whenever we're talking to others, we're also talking to ourselves. And what I found is that I would have my buttons pushed by people many times. And sometimes I'd have a hook that was positive and I'd be attracted. Sometimes I'd have a hook that was negative and I'd be repelled from people. So I started investigating a little bit about that. And I, um, I found out that I had, I went through the Oxford Dictionary, which is this giant dictionary with thin paper, thousands of entries. And I went through and circled every trait or behavior that I could find in human behavior. And I found 4,628 different Traits. Kind, cruel, nice, mean, pleasant, unpleasant, honest, dishonest, giving, taking. Any possible behavior that a human being could do that had a positive or negative spin on it, I circled it. And then out to the side of that on the on the dictionary, I wrote down who in my life have I run into that demonstrates this trait to the most extreme example, positively or negatively. And I write their initial. Then I would go in there and I would ask the simple question. 
So where and when do I display or demonstrate this trait, this action or inaction? Um, and I would identify memories of when and where I've done it, and I would keep accumulating them until I found where I have done that 100% to the same degree, quantitatively, qualitatively, as the person that I perceived that was doing it to the most extreme. Well, I was humbled because I realized I had both nice and mean and kind and cruel and honest and dishonest and deceitful and upfront and open and closed. I had every single trait. We all do, don't we? There's nothing missing in any of us. And by the way, that you don't have to get rid of any part of yourself to love yourself. All the parts, the positive, the negative, everything, are all serving you. If they didn't serve you, they would have gone extinct. Mm. The behaviors of human beings, any, anyone that don't serve human beings, go extinct. So we have this fantasy we want to get rid of half of ourselves, but this is a delusion. There's nothing to get rid of. So what I did is I found out all the where I had all the traits. I mean, every one of them. Then I, if I saw it as a positive trait, then I asked, what are the downsides of the trait? And if I saw it as a negative trait, what were the upsides of the traits? And I leveled the playing field until the traits were neither good nor evil, neither positive nor negative, neither attractive or repulsive. They were simply traits. And then when I did that, I realized now when I'm interacting with people, I notice myself a lot more neutral and less reactive. So instead of waiting for me to react and then have to discover this, I went ahead and worked in advance to try to neutralize a lot of my judgments. And I found out that then I was more poised and present or purposeful, more patient or productive when my interactions with other people by doing that in advance. So the Demartini method, that's just one of the columns of 48 columns now in the method, one of the columns of realization that people go through. Another one is the realization that uh, not only do you do everything that the person does, because whatever you see in them is you, the seer, the seeing, and the seen is the same, but there's two sides to it. And that if you look very carefully, when you first meet somebody, let's say you're a, a beautiful girl and you meet this super intelligent guy, and it's like an aphrodisiac. You go, wow, I love his brain, man. He's got great brains. And then, you know, you date him. And within six months, guess what you're thinking? He's always manipulative. He's, uh, he outwits me. He talks uh, down to me. He thinks he knows everything. He always talks. And then you find out the very trait you admired has its downsides. And then a guy meets this girl and she goes, oh, she's hot. Ooh, man. And then six months later, you go, oh, they find the other side of it. You know, she's focused on herself. She's high maintenance. She cost a fortune. And when we're making love, she's focused on looking at herself, not me. All kinds of things are happening. And then you find out there's two sides to every trait. The sooner you know there's two sides to the trait, the less reactive you become. So those are just two columns of the 48 columns that I, I help people go through um, in the Break to Experience and also the Demartini Method. It is so important, this work, isn't it? It is so important to really deeply know and remember that we have both sides. There's a front and a back to everything, and we have both. But what I've kind of come to realize is people aren't willing to take responsibility or do the work. So what would you say to that? Well, I think the old proverb is that when the pain of regret outweighs the pain of discipline, they get into action. When people come to the Breakthrough Experience, um, some of them don't know that they're going to be sitting there for some hours and working on this. But at the end of it, they're grateful. Because they 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 they're all grateful because I mean we don't let them out <laughs> till they till they finish, and it's not that we force them. We just keep pushing them to 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 make sure they do it because at the end they look in the mirror and they thank themselves. They feel more love for themselves. They have less noise in the brain. I mean, we had a, a group of Buddhist uh, meditators in uh, the program program not too far back. We had fifty of them, and um, they meditate every day. And when they, I, I explained to them that the content of all the noise in the brain uh, that you have to clear during your meditation just to become centered is nothing more than all the lopsided perceptions and judgments that you keep holding in your subconscious mind. And um, so I said, so what we're going to do is we'll do the method and you're going to dissolve a lot of the noise. And then you'll notice that instead of waiting 15 minutes to get into meditation, you're in meditation the second you begin. And when they saw that, and they saw that that noise, what that noise is and where it's derived from, they then had a motive to want to clear that so they could have deeper meditations, more efficient use of, of time. And um, so that was just one motive. So I gave them an insight and an incentive 
to want to do the work for their mastery of meditation, for instance. The same thing in the muscles of the body for a yogis. Uh, there was a muscles that, you know, you have your extensors and your flexors, your abductors, adductors, your internal rotators, external rotators, pronators and supinators. All these things are storing emotions. And anytime you have your values supported or challenged, different muscles turn on and tighten or relax. And so a lot of the tensions and tightness in the body is these, these conflicts inside our psyche. And by doing this method, they immediately go, oh my God, I didn't have to stretch. I didn't have to loosen up. My body was normally toned and more flexible because a rigid mind with a judgment rigids the body, brings the body into rigidity. But the second you have now adaptability and resilience and you have more objectivity, which is even-mindedness and more appreciation and love, the body loosens up. So not only does the mind reduce its noise, but the body loosens up, which increases longevity and many other factors. So the more benefits they see of why they're doing the exercise, the more it becomes spontaneous if it matches their values into why they would want to take the time to do it Mm. incrementally daily. You believe in perfect divine order. For someone who comes to you who's going through serious adversity, you know, maybe they've lost someone, maybe they've just been diagnosed with a serious disease or something like that, you know, and they say, well, John, how? How is this divine perfect order? What would you say? Well, first of all, uh, I, my experience, and this is going to be probably a stretch for some people, I, I took, I've taken many, I don't even know how many hundreds of people, thousands of people now. Uh, I have them go down to the most traumatic, tragic moment of their life. And, uh, you know, I get, pin it down. Where was it? When was it? What was the content? What was it related to? Et cetera. And I've shown them that there is never a tragedy in their life without them being above equilibrium with either pride, mania, elation, uh, cockiness, some sort of an elevation of their own perception of themselves or others. And that the tragedy is a neutralizing event. Just like if they're down below equilibrium and they're minimizing themselves or upset, they attract um, comedy to bring them up. Tragedy brings them back into equilibrium. And so once I help them do that, they, they then they have a deeper reflection on what role they're playing in these dynamics. So they're not just to thinking this is happening to them. Because as long as you dissociate and think the outer world is dictating your inner experience, uh, you're missing the mark. Because as William James said, nothing, you know, on the outside, it's not what happens to us. It's our perceptions, decisions, and actions to it and what we make of it. Like Victor Frankl in the concentration camps, he found meaning in it and survived. The rest of them didn't. And they were angry and blamed and they died. So the first thing is to find out uh, that. The second thing is to realize that there is no tragedy without something of the other side. There's never a crisis without a blessing. There can't be. Every event is like a magnet with two sides. If you choose to see one side, it's your choice to, to blind yourself and create a conscious and unconscious split. Wisdom is allowing the unconscious, what you're unaware of, to be surfaced, and it's always the opposite. So when somebody says, you know, I've got cancer, I've worked with so many thousands of cases of cancer, I'm, I'm used to it and I deal with it quite often. And so I tell them, I said, all right, so what are the benefits that have come into your life as a result of discovering you now have cancer? And well, I've gotten closer to my loved ones. Great. Well, I always say cancer is a last ditch effort to try to get you to love the parts of you and the others that you've been resistant to. And so they, they start doing that. I said, what else? I've given myself permission to not do the work I've been not wanting to do because I've been in a job I've hated where they found out that there was a major shock uh, or event that they're really angry at. And they're basically humbled by this uh, health issue. So it basically looks at the benefits of it. When they start to do it, they start extracting meaning. The mean is between two extremes. To extract meaning is to bring it back into balance. So we ask how specifically, if this is a negative experience in your mind, how are the benefits to it? Once we neutralize it, which I've not had any difficulty doing in any case, and I've had the most traumatic cases, most amazing cases you can, I I can't even describe. Some people almost get nauseated hearing some of the cases. I've never seen one. There's nothing your mortal body can experience that your mortal soul can't love. And so wisdom is knowing how to ask the question, to bring your mind back into balance, see the other side, take the conscious and unconscious and put them together. And when you do, you see the hidden order and you discover the higher meaning behind what's happening and purpose of why it's happening in your life. And that in itself changes the physiology for helping healing cancer or helps you transcend the illusion that you've been traumatized without a blessing. 
Yeah. Wow. So you'd say definitely <clears throat> suffering is failing to see the other side. Well, the, the definition, according to one Buddhist text, the definition of suffering was the desire for to obtain, the desire to fulfill or have whatever is not obtainable, the desire to obtain what's not obtainable, and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable. And if you have a magnet in front of you, and I, I, I hand you this magnet, and I say, um, I'll give you a billion dollars cash if you can give me only the positive pull of the magnet. Now, if you're intelligent and you understand Maxwell's equations, you would know that you can't get a positive pull without a negative pull. They come together. But if you're ignorant, you will strive to cut the magnet in half and give me the positive pull back. And to your surprise, you'll discover the positive pull will have a positive and negative pull, and the negative pull will have a negative and positive pull. And you go, hmm, I didn't do it fast enough. Let me do it again. And if you're ignorant, you'll just keep striving to get a one-sided world. You'll keep striving for the unavoidable and keep trying to avoid the unavoidable. And that's the source of human suffering. The source of human suffering is expecting something that's not real. And, uh, it, and you keep banging your head against the wall trying to get something that's not going to occur. And that's what people do. They, they expect you know, life to be up, never down, positive, never negative, happy, never sad, a sweet, never bitter, kind, never cruel, one-sided addictions. And I always say bipolar condition is a byproduct of monopolar addiction. The addiction to one side is what splits you up further. And your animal nature, your amygdala region in the brain, is trying to avoid predator and seek prey. So it's our animal nature that lives in this delusion. But our angelic nature is more objective and embraces both sides of life and learns how to unconditionally love and embrace the two sides evenly. This is mastery. <sighs> Wow. And you say the purpose of marriage and children is not for happiness. It's to make sure you grow and they force us to look at what we suppress. And now I freaking love this so much. And this has radically changed my relationships. So, you know, how, how does that play out? You know, how in our marriages, in our relationships, in our children, how does that play out? You know, what, it's not for happiness and, and making sure that we grow and they're there to support our growth and our evolution and to show us what we're not looking at. Um, how does, how does one go about doing that? If, if, <laughs> you know, like, especially if they're, they're not willing to look at it, like what can, what do they, what can we do? Well, I have to develop that, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take it steps here. Yes. Um, first of all, each individual has a unique set of values, like I mentioned. Yes. And anytime somebody does something that you perceive as supportive of your values, you tend to open up, you tend to be vulnerable and gullible, and you tend to embrace them and open up to them. Kind of like if all of a sudden you saw prey in the, in the wild and you were an animal and you saw your prey, you would immediately open up your mouth and want to engulf it and ingest it in. Because things that support your values that are anabolic, that want to make you, that you think build you up, you're going to want to eat. So you're going to take that in and you're receptive to that. And when you do, you, um, you depend on it. Food, you depend on it. Mm. But anything that challenges your values, which is represented as predator out there, um, you tend to close down on, you tend to withdraw, you become skeptical, you're cynical, you avoid. So we seek and open up to things that support our values. We tend to close down and avoid things that challenge our values. That's our nature. Which is where the most growth happens. Well, what happens is if we have, imagine this, if we have a child and we give it everything it wants, whenever it wants, every time it wants, and he has no challenge and he's only gets supported and he's only given everything he wants, he becomes spoiled, he stays juvenile dependent, and he doesn't grow up. Mm. And if we get challenge and we give that child responsibilities, accountabilities, challenges, etc., he becomes precociously independent and stronger. And whenever he becomes dependent and, he, and infatuates and depends on us and becomes juvenile dependent, he moves away from his own authority and his own authenticity and becomes a little baby that depends on us and eventually resents us because we've made him dependent. But the person that we end up holding accountability and give challenge to, he becomes precociously independent, more entrepreneurial-like, more confident, and he appreciates you in the long run. But what's been shown is that we need a little of both, that maximum growth and development occurs at the border of support and challenge. And our, if you will, our innermost thermostat, our soul, if you will, automatically knows that. 
in homeostats our psyche. And so if we go around and we keep looking for things to support our values like the little animal, we keep attracting challenges to make us grow again. So if we're looking for you know, ease, we attract difficulty. If we're looking for pleasure, we attract pain. If we're looking for freedom, we get constraint. Nature always has a pair of opposites. And the more we get addicted to the one, the more the other one is painful. But when we finally realize that you need both to grow, then you start to embrace that the relationship that you're in is designed to give you both. They will sometimes support, sometimes challenge you, sometimes nice, sometimes mean. And if, you, if they were nice all the time, you become dependent. If they're tough on you, you become more independent. And you need a balance of those two to respect each other. Just like when people first meet, you really know you have a match when you can banter and support and challenge each other equally. That's a sign you've got a match. If you can only support them and afraid of walking on eggshells to challenge them, you're the underdog. If you want, like to challenge them and you don't want to support them, you're the overdog. But if you can do both, you have a nice relationship. A, a, if you see more similarities to them than you do differences, you're infatuated. If you see more differences, you're resentful. If you see a balance of similarities and differences, you have love. And so in our relationships, we must have both. We are blinded by the downsides then when we make love. So anytime we're infatuated with somebody and make love with them, the very things we don't see in them that we actually will discover later that we'll resent are being genetically, epigenetically coded into the children to make sure that when they grow up, we'll say, oh, you're just like your dad. Oh, you're just like your mom. To make sure that they are teaching us to love the parts we weren't willing to see and didn't want to see to make sure we love those because we're not going to not love our children. It's forcing us to love oh both sides. Goodness. You honestly blow my mind. Your your wisdom and and everything that you do is just has helped me and my husband so much. Like I can't even tell you. And I'm not just saying that because you're you're with me today, but it's really helped me a lot. But you were actually, I want to rewind a little bit and um I remember you saying you were dyslexic as a child and now you're such a prolific writer and you're a teacher and this is, you know, your core values are traveling and educating and researching. What was it like growing up as a child being dyslexic and how did that affect you? Well, when I was, uh, I don't know exactly the time I began, but I know by a year and a half, I was already at a speech pathologist. So when I was a year and a half old, I also was born with my arm and leg turned in. So I had a pigeon arm and leg or whatever. And I had to wear braces until I was four to straighten out my arms and legs. So, and I was left-handed, which was sinister in those days. You're not supposed to be left-handed. They tried to punish that and try to get you right-handed. And um, so I had learning problems. I didn't know it. I also had speech problems. And um, by the time I was in first grade, six, seven years old, my teacher tried to teach me how to learn to read, and um, it just wasn't working. I couldn't make sense out of it. I spelled things backwards. I wrote backwards. I wrote literally across to le- right to left, mm. and I spelled things backwards. And the teacher just says, you know, finally, my parents were brought to the class, and she says, I'm afraid your son, he's never going to be able to read or write. He'll never communicate. I don't think he's going to amount to a thing or go very far in life. But he is good at sports, because when I got out of the braces, all I wanted to do is run. So I, I was a good runner. So she said, if I were you, I'd put him in some sort of sport because that way he at least will have some self-esteem. So that was, I, I only made it through the elementary school with the help of really three smart kids, Martha Rose Scartosi, Clinton Duvall, and, and Jerry Sampson. These three people were the smartest kids. And I befriended them and asked them, what did they get out of the class each day? And what did they get out of the reading? And I made it through elementary school with the help of those three kids and a couple other ones. And then I moved from Houston, Texas to Richmond, Texas, and I didn't have the support to kids there. And it was a low socioeconomic area, and it was one-third Spanish and one-third African and one-third American and low, really low, poor uh, things, a lot of gangs, a lot of drugs, and I didn't have a support team. So I ended up dropping out of school. At and what was, age? How old were you then? Well, I really, I started failing really at 13 when I moved there, uh, 12 and 13. and then. Um, I just left home at 13. So I was a street kid really from age 13. And then I, I, I hung around locally in the Houston area at the beach, in bowling alleys, uh, parks, cars, whatever. I just lived. Where did, you, where did you sleep? 
Uh, it varied. There was a there was a big 24 hour bowling alley that I used to sleep in the back of sometimes behind some pinball machines, and then um, at age 13. Th- yeah, 13. Wow. And then sometimes I slept, um, you know, at the beach. I went down to the beach. Uh, I, I slept in this park in Rosenberg, um, and there was cars. Sometimes I could find abandoned cars. A lot of people didn't lock the cars in those days. So you could sleep in a car pretty easily. Um, sometimes in this diner that was open if it was cold out. Sometimes at friends. Um, I mean, I just I had lots of places that you always found some place to hang out. Sometimes in the back of a, on a on a vent outside a building where it's warmer. So I always find a way. Then when I turned fourteen, I, I hitchhiked out to California and lived in the beaches of California. And I, I slept uh, behind the Golden Bear where all the great bands used to sing. I met all the band players, you know, Buddy Miles and and uh, all kind of people. Um, so I had night there and on the beach. And was that because they, did your parents kick you out, or was it something that you consciously chose to do? Was to leave school and to leave home? Well, it's sort of both. Because, you know, I, they never kicked me out. Uh, what happened was, <laughs> it's funny, when I was um, 13, there was a, a buddy who was having, um, his parents were leaving town for the weekend. And so we thought we'd take advantage of that. So um, he had his girlfriend, and I had a, a chick that I was interested in, and we invited them to come over. And so we were going to have a, a great time over the weekend, right? Well, my, I told my dad, look, I, I was playing pool, pool with him in the barn at our place. And um, he, I said, well, Dad, I got to go. I need to get cleaned up. I'm going into town. He said, well, you've been into town a lot this week. Why don't you stay home tonight? And I said, well, no, Dad. I, I didn't want to tell him I had a chick waiting for me. So I told him, I said, I'm going into town. And he says, well, no, you're not going to town. You're going to stay home tonight. I said, well, Dad, I'm not going to. I'm going to go into town. He said, well, if you go into town, you don't come back tonight. And I said, well, then so be it. I wasn't going to pass up this check for some reason. <laughs> and uh, so I packed my little bag and I took off. And I don't think he expected me to do that. He wasn't really angry with me. He was just trying to get me to stay home that night. And um, so I took off. And to his uh, surprise, I didn't come back. And so I took his word for it. Later, he found me. Uh, at a park one time, and he says, "Well, son, if you do want to come home, you're welcome to come home." And I said, "Well, I'm I'm a, I'm on an adventure here. This is kind of an interesting adventure." He said, "Well, you're always welcome home." And um, you know, how, how are you doing on food and how are you doing on things? And I said, "I'm I'm surviving. Don't worry about it. I'll figure this thing out." And I did some odd jobs, and I did uh, panhandling, and I did uh, all kinds of things. And and all I know is that uh, my dad told me one time. He said. He, called, he found me at the beach and he said, he says, well, how you doing? I said, I'm doing great. He says, well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I believe you're capable of doing it. I believe you have the resources to survive. I tried to teach you to be an entrepreneur because when I was nine, he, he made me pay for room, clothing and rent, um, wow. $7 and 50 cents a week and made me work. So I had to work the neighborhood and do landscaping and stuff. He wanted me to learn how to be an entrepreneur because he knew I wasn't going to pass school. Right. So he, he, you know, he was training me to survive out there. So I'm an entrepreneur since really about 13. I've been really kind of a street kid and I'm still nomadic. As you know, I travel full time around the world. I don't, I, I live on a ship called the world and I just travel full time around the world. So I, uh, I guess that's never gotten out of me and I love it. I love, I always said the universe is my playground. The world is my home. Every country's a room in the house and every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. Beautiful. Do you ever feel like you crave, you know, some, um, I don't want to say groundedness or stability, but maybe like, do you crave having that one central place or no, you, you find home wherever you go? I, I know this sounds kind of odd, but I, uh, I believe that the, truly the world is home. I don't know how to describe it. I feel at home in Tokyo or China or any European country or Australia or New Zealand. I don't care where I'm at. I, I, South Africa, Africa, I feel at home wherever I go. Mm. I, I don't, people don't understand that sometimes. And of course, you know, because I live on the ship, the world, it goes around the world and I get to go to countries all over the world. I, I've, I've been in about 119 countries speaking and I just love traveling and people don't understand that. But I said, well, it's actually quite a great life. I hit a, a service express button and I get my food and I get my laundry done and I go to the thing and I rendezvous with my loved ones around the world. So our whole home, our whole family is a kind of jet set gypsies. And, um, 
you know, my daughters are meeting me here in Australia and, and meeting on the ship here in a few weeks. And and I, my girlfriend, I'm meeting in about uh, two weeks in South Africa. So we, we have a jet set life. Instead of walking from room to room, I fly. Instead of uh, speaking from room to room, we Skype. So it's it's just, I live in a big friggin' house. <laughs> it's pretty big. <laughs> And it sounds, it sounds great. It sounds really good. So I would love to know, what is one thing that you're working on within yourself or you'd like to improve within yourself at the moment that you wouldn't necessarily want anyone to know? Well, I don't think of myself as improving. I've, I've already been doing through all these things. I'd, I always say that we have a divine magnificence and a divine love inside us that I don't think there's anything that needs. I don't even think in terms of improvement. Because I think I don't use moral language. I found that unproductive. Um, improve, disimprove, better, worse, good, bad, right, wrong. I don't. I don't find those productive. I think those actually interfere with human commu- communication and they set up false expectations. I just I'm grateful for my life, and I and I no matter what I've done or not done, I feel I'm worthy of love. And I try to teach people the same because they're the only reason you ever judge yourself is because you've injected somebody else's values into your life. And then created imperative shoulds and ought tos and supposed tos that counterbalance your own values instead of honoring your own values. I honor my values. I do what I love pretty well every day. I delegate all lower priority things. All I do is research, write, travel, teach, which is what I love doing most. I've hired people to do all the rest. I serve people as much as I can. And um, I love my life. I don't, I don't have anything that I need to regret or fix or anything like that, the way I look at it. Beautiful. What is your definition of unconditional love? Because do you feel like everyone has a different definition and what's yours? Well, anytime you have an emotion about something, you have a partial awareness. And in other words, if I, if I see more positives than negatives in you and I'm attracted or infatuated with you, um, I'm only seeing half of you. I've got an unconscious side that's blinded. And I always say, if I'm infatuated, I'm blind to the downsides. If I'm resentful, I'm blind to the upsides. But when I'm not blind and I see both sides synchronously at the same time, there's no condition now. You only have a condition when you only see one side. Mm. And when you actually see both sides and the synthesis and synchronicity of compromise opposite at the same time, you have love and there's no condition. So you have unconditional love when you embrace the synthesis and synchronicity of all compromise opposites in the events that you're perceiving. And that's uh, obtainable. I, I mean, I've developed in the Demartini method. To guarantee that it's not a hit and miss, it's an absolute science. I've worked on it from scientific perspectives. It's reproducible, it's duplicatable. I've taught 4,000 facilitators around the world to use it. They're using it. It's a very powerful tool in helping you obtain that state. Can you stay in that state? No, because you're not designed to. You're designed to have a moment of unconditional love and then go on to your next illusion so you can grow some more. As Richard M. Book in his book Cosmic Consciousness in 1901 from London, Ontario stated, he says that even the most illuminated people in history only had moments of illumination. They didn't stay 24 hours a day in illumination. That's a fantasy and unrealistic expectation that many mystics and new age people try to trap themselves in. Love yourself for all of your reactions and your moments of unconditional love. I feel like some people may believe that some enlightened beings may be in that state all the time, you know, like the Dalai Lama or um, someone like that. Do you believe they are more in that state or do you believe they are in that state all the time or no, they would still have the opposite? Well, I'm absolutely certain that they're not because I know them. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) In fact, I just got invited to do a, um, have a meeting with the Dalai Lama and um, Deepak, uh, Joe Dispenza, myself, and Paul Bailey, they're wanting to have a mastermind group. And I've met them all. They're all, they're just, we're all human beings. It, it is unwise for any teacher, in my opinion, to display a fantasy of one-sidedness. Because what it does is it puts up a false expectation and demand on other people to try to live something they're not going to live. So I always say that if I see people enamored with me, I'll fart on them or something and show them the other <laughs> side. To make sure that they get grounded, because um, I assure you, I've I've sat with the Dalai Lama and heard him have a round with you with some people with arguments and and he's had frustrations and health issues and I mean he, he's a human being and we need to respect people for being human beings dedicated to their mission and not put fantasies and create false legends about people which then set up expectations that nobody can live by and so I'm not a I, I'm I'm sure I've met many great spiritual leaders. And I assure you, they are just human beings. 
Mm. And it's wise to not get lost in this fantasy just because they may temporarily display it up on stage or something like that. I try to be both sides right in front of people just to make sure people don't get caught in those traps. And how do you do that? Just by, by being me. By <laughs> fighting on them? <laughs> well, if I, if I need to, I'll do it. But I, I, I don't, that's not my fr- first choice. That may be a latter choice. But um, I had a guy, pardon me for saying this bizarre qu- statement here, but I had a guy in Buffalo, New York, about 20 years ago that was infatuated with me. He thought I was intelligent and all this other stuff. He didn't realize that if he had asked me questions on tech, IT, uh, baseball, or anything like that, I'm an idiot. I only know what I know. And anything outside my knowing, I'm pretty well ignorant and pretty uh, klutz. And uh, that's why I delegate so much. So what's interesting is uh, he was enamored with me. He was infatuated with me. His mother saw that and saw that he'd done that with a couple other teachers and saw that that sidetracked him. And so she came and attended my breakthrough experience and to make sure he didn't go off on some tangent. And he was in his mid-20s and stuff. And um, I saw what he was doing. So I purposely made, you know, I went out of my way to destroy that infatuation. And the mother was checking me out. And at the end of the, uh, the seminar, she knew exactly what I was doing. I humiliated him. I, I, I did crazy things that would just make sure that he was breaking any infatuation. His mother came up to me and gave me a hug. And she said, thank you for doing that for my son. She saw what I did. I said, well, your son is going to minimize himself and disempower himself if he puts a false expectation on me or any other human being. So we're here to empower him, not to undermine that. And she appreciated that. Four years later, he met up with me and he says, I've hated you for four years after (laughs) I was infatuated. I said, I know. And thank you for that. He said, but that's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. I went out and did things on my own. I didn't rely on everybody else. I became very entrepreneurial. I finally talked to my mother. She told me what you did. I had no idea you did that. Thank you. Mm, I said, well, great. I was, I, I'm interested in giving you a result. And if I have to fart on you to get a result, then I'll fart on you. <laughs> Metaphorically fart or actually fart, either yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Now, let's pretend for one moment that you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum in every single high school around the entire world. What book would you choose besides all of your amazing books? That's a given. They're already going to be in there. Can you share one other book that you would put in the curriculum? Yes, there's a book by Mortimer Adler called Syntopic and Volumes 1 and 2. It's actually two volumes making up one book. And it's called Syntopican Volumes 1 and 2. It's produced by Britannica, the Encyclopedia Britannica series. It's in the great books of the Western world and the great ideas section. And these two books, in my opinion, are the two best books you're going to ever read. And what they are is the greatest ideas by the greatest minds over the last 2,700 years in philosophy, thinking, theology, sciences, etc. And what it is, is basically the, probably the best education. I believe if you study that book inside and out and really understand it, which I've done many years now, um, you, got a, you got a PhD in life. So it covers the most important topics that the most important individuals in history have ever thought about. And it starts from um, metaphysical and physical constructs to science, to religions, to philosophies. It's a very great book I think any human being can study. And it's something you just read, a, you know, it, they have small chapters. You read maybe five, 10 pages in a day and you stop and you reflect on it. And it has all the references from the greatest mind. So it's, it's a lovely piece of work. I recommend it to every human being who comes to my courses. Great. Thank you so much. I'll put that in the show notes so people can go and check that out. So thank you so much. Now, Let's talk about what a day in your life looks like. Now, I know you've said before you're traveling so much and no two days will ever look the same for someone like you who's jet setting around so much and on a plane one day and then on a ship another. But do you, can you run us through like a basic day What and, and particularly focus on your morning routine? Because from a lot of people like yourself and, and great teachers that I love, um, they have a very specific morning routine that helps prime them for the day. So I would love to hear what uh, you do for your morning routine and then how your day uh, pans out. Well, it, it there is variation, but I would say that the most significant thing I do is I'll, I'll get up. I'll usually um, 
brush my teeth. I'll kind of wash my face. I'll do some push-ups, sit-ups, some calisthenics a little bit, stretching, some yoga kind of activities. Uh, I will usually shower and clean up, get dressed. I'll go to my computer. I'll quickly check if there's any urgent uh, emails. I'll prioritize them, delete most of them, and, and send them out to the people that take care of things. Um, and then I'll have one of three or four different options. If I have a vac vacant time there, I will research and write. If I don't, I'll usually have interviews or I'll have a, a speaking engagement. I mean, I do 350. Uh, the most I've done is 426 speeches in a year, but the average is about 350 speeches a year. And uh, some of them are all day long, as you know. And then I do about 1,000 interviews a year, radio, television, newspapers, and magazines. So I'm either writing articles and researching writing articles. I'm either doing interviews and magazines, newspapers, or I go do radio and television, or I'm doing consulting. So I'm, and then my day is consisting of that every single day, seven days a week. Beautiful. Love it. What are three things you're most grateful for? Because I know you're very prolific with your gratitude. Uh, I remember when I first met you, you had this big book that you pulled out of your suitcase and you write in your gratitude book every single day. Actually, no, I think you may, you may have had the book, but you were also typing it. So what are three things you're most recently deeply grateful for in your life? Well, <laughs> I have uh, recently run into a new mate, new partner. And so I have to say that that is a very, I'm very inspired by my new partner. Uh, this woman is quite exceptional. Uh, she's a, um, I, I don't know, I, I basically believe that there's seven areas of life. And any area of our life we don't empower, somebody else overpowers. And I am, I believe that I'm relatively empowered in each of these areas. And so I'm interested in a woman that's empowered in each of these areas to share with. And I've got a woman that is empowered in all these areas. She's uh, a brilliant, uh, Harvard uh, educated, and she's, I mean, extremely brilliant in her work. She's uh, in engineering, philosophy. Uh, she studied most all the great religious traditions and perennial philosophies. She is, um, she's also in business. She's run uh, the largest uh, company in the Southern Hemisphere. She's run train companies, nuclear power plants. Uh, uh, she has done amazing things, uh, owned media companies, real estate companies. So she's a very savvy business lady, uh, financially viable, very vi viable there. She, she's got a family. We have, she has four kids. She's socially influential and does a lot for the governments and um, physically attractive and beautiful. So that's one thing I'm very grateful for right now. That's a recent uh, experience. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm, I'm getting ready to, to uh, complete, probably in the next five days, a new textbook, a 450-page textbook on mathematics uh, called Explorations into Infinity and Eternity. And this is a mathematical exploration of our mind's journey uh, into the conceptual abstractions of infinity and eternity. And how did those constructs through history and through the great philosophers and religions um, get imbibed? And I'm going through, and, and it's a beautiful textbook on that. And then I'm also um, had the opportunity to see my daughter. All my my kids are doing their, what they love. My dream was to have all my kids find their mission and fulfill their mission and do what they love. My my daughter's doing fantastic in our fashion company. Uh, my other daughter's doing fantastic in the training and education company. My son is now assisting us in that also. So those are three things. But I keep records of all my gratitudes daily. Mm. And believe it or not, um, this interview and the next interview and the next interview I have in the next uh, hour are all listed, typed, and already in my gratitude. The opportunity to be able to do these interviews because I don't get to reach people without people like yourself helping me reach people. So I'm grateful for those. So they're already typed this morning and last night. They've been typed and they're ready to go. So I keep a, I keep a record of, of I have the largest um, accumulation of gratitudes of anybody I've met on earth. And I was born on Thanksgiving Day. My mom told me to count my blessings each day. So I do that. And I can vouch for that because I've seen I've seen the books. And um... well, yeah, there's fifteen thousand volume, fifteen thousand pages of them. Wow. And do you do you write down every morning and every night what you're grateful for, or is it just in the mornings? Uh, it it sums vary. Every night, 
unless I'm working, sometimes in the breakthrough experience, I don't get back here to three or four in the morning. Mm. Uh, I may wait till the morning to do that when I get up, but I do it every day. I don't miss a day. And is it just three things or do you kind of just whatever comes well, out, comes out? No, no. I may have uh, 20, 30 things in a day. I may have mm-hmm. five. I may have, I don't think it's anything less than about five to seven, but I, I, on average, I have probably 10 to 20 things a day. Wow. Beautiful. And how important do you think gratitude is for living, you know, a happy, abundant life? Well. Um, yeah, fulfilling life to me, I don't, I, as Henry James, the brother of William James, who said, uh, nothing of the senses satisfies the soul. The only thing that satisfies the soul is thank you. I love you. So anything you can't say thank you and anything you can't love in your life is a, is an incomplete awareness of what's going on. And so I go sh- make sure that I see things from that perspective. And if I don't, I go in there and balance out and use my method, then write the gratitudes from that. And I'm enriched. And, um, there's an abundance of things we can be grateful for. I mean, just abundant. I have proof of it by my listing. But I, my experience is that the moment I do that, I'm more authentic. I'm more inspired. I'm more uh, strategic. I'm in my executive center. I see my goals. I accomplish more goals. I get to do amazing things, go to amazing places, get to meet amazing people, and get to document amazing gratitudes every day. So I'm, I'm, um, I think there's a, a science to it, and I try to teach as many people as I can to do it so they get the result. And when they do, they see the results. So, mm, I mean, it's definitely been something that's really helped shift my own um, perception on life and it's really helped me a lot. So I practice, you know, every day and I often just even find myself walking around just saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, or driving in my car and just saying thank you and it really does make such a difference. Well, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to give a false impression. I also have moments when I don't see that perfection. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, and I, I have other languages at times. <laughs> but, but at what, the same what time, is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, have, uh, I have what I call sacred acronyms, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, uh, I have those too. I'm, I'm just like any other human being. But I also have a, a relatively quick response to those and get back into the others because what I do is I, I, I do it every day. That's the blessings of my life. I get to work with people every day, which is a, the more I help others do that, the more I get to do that because it makes me accountable. So I, I love doing that because it, we both win. Other people win, I win by doing yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So in your opinion, um, I talk a lot about um, health, wealth, and love. What is one of the most important things that we can do for our health? One, one tip, one of the most important things. Well, I mean, there's many things, but I, I would say that if you're, if you're prioritizing your day, and you are living by highest priorities and doing something that truly is meaningful where you can't wait to get up in the morning and do it and narrowing it down to what is really, truly most productive, most meaningful, most inspiring, most fulfilling. You bring blood and glucose and oxygen to your executive center in the prefrontal cortex, the prosencephalon area of the brain. And when you do, this area is involved in inspired visions, strategic planning, executing plans, and self-governance. So you have the highest degree of self-governance and mastery in that state by prioritizing your actions. When you do, you don't live to eat, you eat to live. You are more moderate in the way you eat. You're more conscientious about what you put in your body. I have more energy than anybody because I drink water. It makes you more conscientious of doing wise things. And I think that if we live by priority, we awaken our love and wisdom If we don't, we live in our phobias and philias and prides and shames, and we perturb ourselves and oscillate, and we have instabilities, which shorten our lifespan. Mm, Yes, I couldn't agree more. And what is one of the most important things you can do for your wealth? And when I'm when I'm talking about wealth, I mean either your finances or the career. You know what you do in the world. What you kind of already have answered it with the other question because it kind of feeds out into every area. But is there anything else like one of the most important things that you think we could do for that area of our life? Money circulates through the economy from those who value it least to those who value it most. So if you don't value financial wealth, it'll never stay with you. It'll pass through your hands into consumerism and depreciables. And I didn't have a value on wealth building until I turned 28. I kept saving money to buy things, saving money to go on trips, saving money to buy a car, saving money to get a house. 
I was spending my money on things. I didn't actually begin to have it work for me where I would save my money and invest my money so it worked for me until 28. And then I realized that if I'd start to do that and I pass up immediate gratification for long-term vision with my money, eventually my money will buy me all the things that I want and I'll go to work, not because I have to, but because I love to and I get to select my destiny. And so I started saving 34 years ago and I became financially independent to not too far after that. And today I'm, I'm uh, quite abundantly wealthy and I can pretty well do what I want to do. And if I never had to work another day, I could live for 99 years easily on my wealth. And that's because I saved and invested and let my money work for me. If not, you're a slave to money. If you are wisely managing it, it becomes, you become its master. I'd rather be a master of money than a slave to it. Mm, and one of, for everyone who um, would like to kind of adopt that mentality, your book, um, How to Make One Hell of a Profit and Still Get Into Heaven is amazing. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I wrote that book. I was going to an Italian restaurant in Madison Avenue um, to meet a very lovely gentleman who is like, I, I know this is going to sound bizarre, but he's a competitor to Donald Trump in New York. And um, so we were having dinner, him and a girlfriend and my wife and I. And on the walk to that restaurant, the title of that book came to me because I saw so many people struggling internally, primarily because of religious dogma um, about receiving and holding on to money. They had this internal conflict about being wealthy and charging for their services and valuing themselves and stuff. So I wrote the book to try to help people break through that illusion and to understand that uh, the mastery of wealth is the mastery of the spiritual path. Uh, let me give you an example. If you exaggerate yourself and become cocky and self-righteous and proud and look down on others, when you're trying to sell to them, you're not caring enough to meet their needs and find out what they're valuing, and so you lose sales. If you minimize yourself to others and put them on pedestals, um, you'll sacrifice in the negotiation table and you won't keep a profit. But if you have an equality and an equanimity within you and an equity between you and others, you'll care enough to find out what their needs are altruistically. You'll care enough about yourself narcissistically to put those into equilibrium to create fair, sustainable exchanges a transaction that sustains. And that mastery of equanimity in our mathematical exchanges is necessary for our own spiritual understanding and our own mastery of ourself. So true spirit without matter is expressionless. Matter without spirit is motionless. And the mastery of both is the same. It's equanimity of mind and of the, an inspiration of life. Mm, and I'll put the link to that book in the show notes so people can read it. I absolutely loved it. So thank you for writing that. And I have one more question before we wrap up. Um, what is, in your opinion, one of the most important things that we could do for love? Well, I don't think we can ever escape love. I always say that love is all there is. All else is illusion. Awakening our minds to the ever presence of love is one of the great things. That's what I try to teach in the Breaks Experience. Help people see life that no matter what's going on at any moment of reading, uh, the equal and opposite is there with you. And those two pair of sides make up love. So there is nothing but love. All else is illusion. It's it's knowing how to ask the right question to help you become aware of the unconscious. Our intuition is always trying to reveal the unconscious to the conscious to bring those pairs into equilibrium synchronously. So the quality of our life is the quality of the questions we ask. If we ask the question specifically, is whatever I'm experiencing helping me fulfill my mission in life, see both sides to it, and we see it on the way, not in the way, we're great. We're graced by the presence of love, which is always present. We don't have to love. We can't escape mm, it. Yes, yes, I love it. Well, is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up? That's the bottom line. You can't screw this thing up. You. We, the only time we think we screw things up is if we injected some other person who we've given power and authority to, their values into our life and compared our actions to somebody else's values. And that's like a cat comparing himself to a fish when says, I can't swim, or a fish comparing itself to a cat and I can't climb. That's foolish. Honor yourself and give yourself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth. No matter what you've done or not done, you're worthy of love. So give yourself permission to just go for what you truly love in life. Nobody's going to get up in the morning and dedicate your life to you except you. If you don't get up and prioritize your life and do what you love, don't expect somebody else to help you do that. Get on with doing it. Take command of your life. It's your life. Mm. 
John Martini, thank you so much. Before we go, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. I am incredibly grateful. Thank you and I love you. And I'm just so grateful to have you in my life and my husband is too. You've made such a huge impact on both of our lives. Your work and just you as a human being, you're a very generous and beautiful person and being in your presence is always, always puts a smile on my face. So thank you again. I'm deeply grateful from the bottom of my heart and I hope to run into you again soon in Sydney. All right, very much. And thank you for this interview and thank you as a couple a great uh, exemplary couple for, for the world to see. So thank you. What an epic human he is, right? I honestly could have chatted to him for hours and hours, and I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface. You know, some of his books on money and business and career are as equally as amazing as his work in relationships. So we may have to bring him back on so we can dive into that stuff. Let me know if that's something that you guys would be interested in. On Twitter, you can tweet me at Mel underscore Ambrosini and use the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini Show. And let me know as well who else you want me to have on the show. I am open to all of your suggestions. And if you got a lot out of this, please subscribe. Leave me a five-star review so that we can spread more love and awareness around this conversation to all of the people out there. You know, we're all in relationships. Humans are hardwired for connection and intimacy. And if we all just knew how to take a little bit more responsibility for how we're showing up and not project our stuff onto everyone else, I think there would be a lot less arguments in the world. So yeah, please share this out with all the people that you love and leave me a five-star review. And for everything that we mentioned in the podcast, check out the show notes at melissaambrosini.com forward slash three and check out all my other podcasts there as well. And that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash podcast. Thank you so, so much for being here, for listening and for wanting to be the best version of yourself and for showing up for you today. You seriously rock. I love you. So like I mentioned, if there's someone in your life that you think could really benefit from hearing this episode, please share it with them right now. And until next time, gorgeous, don't forget love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.